Hi everyone, I'm Mary, and today we're going to look at Text Talks history, specifically early aviation combat engineers. I don't know anything about this Doc Christmas, other than that Tex has already mentioned he's an actual medical doctor, which is still surprising, and that everyone in the chat has told me this guy is, um, when you think of a snake oil salesman, this guy looks at that and laughs and says, <laughs> noob, get on my level. So we're going to jump right in. You guys know the deal. There's a link below to the original video. Hit it up. And if you like this, go tell Tex. He's awesome. Let him know. Now let's get started. Christmas saves the world. Oh, I get to use my 20s voice By again. 1918, America had joined the war. Oh, America versus Brigadier Germany. General John T. Thompson of Newport, Kentucky that would be Thompson. trying to figure out oh. his trench broom around now. And in between serving as the director of arsenals and winning the Distinguished Service Medal for his contributions, he would be a fairly busy guy. Yeah. That same year, Dr. Christmas decided that he too would do his patriotic... Wait, that's actually what he looks like? You know, Tex had that stylized version of him. I thought, oh, that's kind of insane. And I'm just looking at this guy and thinking, wow, he looks like someone who just hung up and he says, I'm sorry, sir, there's nothing I can do for your mother. She's dead, Jim. Followed by, okay. So do we hide the body now? No? Oh, she's still alive? Oh. Give me a minute. It just, wow. That is literally the face of someone who doesn't actually know how to do their job. Now, maybe I'm letting my entire perspective of this be shaped by the fact that I know he's a con artist, but he looks like a quack. It's the glasses. It's definitely the glasses. I, I can't stand those glasses. Anyone who wears glasses with that little hump in the middle, I think they're just fraudulent to begin with. Ugh. That's actually the ones that are only centered on the eyes. And, ugh duty and directly contribute to the war effort. But to tell that story, we first have to figure out how exactly Dr. Christmas became an aviation pioneer. And that is where this story gets truly very interesting. What? While we can reliably say that he graduated medical school in 1905, yeah. his actions in the years immediately thereafter are substantially more difficult Realize it's easier to con people in a burgeoning industry. I remember him talking about this, yeah. To follow in any meaningful detail. People start dying. Oh, no. Him or someone else. that Dr. Christmas developed a sudden and deep interest in aeronautical matters, which he would carry without any loss of enthusiasm whatsoever till the end of his days. Oh, so he actually was in interested. In terms of his place as an aircraft pioneer, oh. the strange saga of Dr. Christmas starts in roughly 1909, Pictured inauguration of William Howard Taft. Holy crap. Sorry, I don't think I've actually seen a picture of this. And that would be Washington, D.C. I know. Oh, this is actually Washington, D.C. I recognize some of these buildings. At least I think that's one of the buildings that became part of the Smithsonian back there. I could easily be wrong, though. For all I know, it's New York. For that year in Washington, D.C. Nope, never mind. He founded the Christmas Aeroplane Company. Dr. That's William actually what Christmas, it. while again a doctor four years out of med school at that point, had pursued no certifications, education, or qualifications in matters related to aircraft design. Okay, this might just be a stupid question, but for anyone who knows this, I'm actually appreciating an answer. Were there certifications at this point for aircraft design? Because it seems like it's only been around for not that long at this point. Or the principles which govern it. But I suppose being a pioneer is all about taking chances. Especially when other people so are in the pilot seat. So he told his very first investors that he had designed a plane which had been built in 1908 and then lost in a crash sometime thereafter in the greater Washington, D.C. area. Seriously? It was fairly normal at the time for early aircraft pioneers to litter the surrounding area with their previous ideas and unrealized Seriously? successes. Seriously? They just left him around? So these claims did not immediately worry his backers or detract from Oh, he lied about everything, huh? Much. His backers didn't, even didn't have a prototype. necessarily need to see an entire intact aircraft to know that someone was an aviator. In those early years, few aviators kept planes for very long. I'm sorry, so he literally started the scams by going, Hey, I'm an aviator. See all these broken pieces? You know it's real because I could definitely crash. I don't know which is more shocking, that he would be so bold as to do that. Or that even though Texas explained why, and that all the aviators just left their broken shit around because, I mean, no one needs to see that. They just know another way it doesn't work. The people were like, hmm, this guy crashed a plane and survived. I should give him money. And then they did. That's like saying, hey, I'm a computer guy. See these broken pieces over here? Yeah, I got that. It doesn't make sense to me. 
granted, I'm looking at hindsight, so maybe that's the point. So when Dr. Christmas was asked about his design, a very real the actual well. plane, he stated that the design as well had completely perished, but not on accident. What? And stranger still, not on the crash. What? At this point, he informed this group of investors that he had to burn all of the documentation of that aircraft in particular to prevent the construction secrets of this unknown Falling and secret aircraft from being stolen by unknown, unnamed, and hostile parties. As the inventors tried to untangle that statement. God damn it. That, <clears throat> the part that annoys me here is I know exactly why this worked. One of the things that really captures people's imagination is intrigue. It's that allure of the unknown that someone knows something. That I was like, oh, by telling you this, you're in a club. It's very exclusive. I can't tell many people because they're after me. That kind of secret knowledge is just catnip to most people in some way, shape, or form. Some people, a little. Some people will honestly go way too far and give a con man tons of money because they just got pulled into the drama. It's why scams work. And... I hate that it suddenly makes sense how he succeeded because he gave people an interesting story for them to feel invested in. This is the kind of person who can tell a good story because he knows the story will work. And the fucked up part is I'm immediately thinking of multiple people right now in reality who are doing this. I'm looking at you, Elizabeth Holmes. Fuck you. Dr. Christmas then claimed to be the first person to fly an aircraft after the Wright brothers. The backers found this series of statements largely implausible. But? Even from a man named Dr. Christmas. So a short while later, he reassured them with a second plane that Did was called the it? Redbird, which was, by all reports, an improbably near exact copy of the AEA Red Wing. But it was named it Redbird, flipped. and thus, in this early age of aviation, perhaps very different. And so I welcome you because to the it's very still new strange enough place to Dr. Christmas occupies, in the golden era of aviation. Amusingly, we know all of these details of Dr. Christmas's life Christmas. as it was the day after Christmas, 1910, on which Seriously? the suit entitled Creed in Fulton versus the Christmas Airplane Company Incorporated at all was oh, filed. Oh, they sued him early. Mr. Fulton, one of Dr. Christmas's investors from the previous year, was not just an aeronautical investor or an aircraft hobbyist. And strangely enough, he also had letters after his name. But he wasn't a medical doctor. Lawyer? Because Mr. Fulton was in fact a lawyer. Call it! Which means Dr. Christmas had, in legal terms... Gonna call it, uh, he done fucked, or done fucked up. Take your pick. Fucked up. Call it! And through this suit, we have a window into the early so machinations is this actual of Dr. Jury Christmas. Drawings, or is this something tax As hired? put before the chicanery so court of Virginia, the suit suggested that Dr. Christmas was pretty much a crook who sold empty so they caught on to him to pretty fast. investors using a variety of aircraft-shaped, if not aircraft-themed props. And failing that, empty promises. And that much is verifiably true. Yeah. As Dr. Christmas's presence at the Harvard-Boston Great Aero Meet in Massachusetts on August 19th of 1910 is well documented. That um, day, never Dr. W.P. Christmas... Okay, I love this a little passive-aggressive now at the bottom. Picture reportedly one of his planes, quote unquote, at Harvard Boston Aero Meet, August 1910. I just love the fact that he's not even showing a little bit of disdain for him. It's the flat out planes. It's just, it's showing the bias, but in such a funny little minor way. While overall, he's actually being very fair in the audio. Well done. Granted, the guy's a scon. I want to say scoundrel and conners at the same time. I was a sconed artist. I wish I'd actually said that fully. That's a really awesome word. I would love to take credit for inventing it. Entered his, quote, Christmas biplane design, of which no documentation of it flies. Flies just ever as been well proven. as a bunch of sleds Over pulled by reindeer. Years, various partners allege Christmas would do precisely this, which is to tow his static display planes to air shows and then never actually demonstrate or successfully sell oh, there's a actually single a lot of photos one of the planes? while simultaneously actually flying, to grossly of surpass or greatly exceed the requirements of whatever trophy was on offer 
in any contest presented. And as such, Dr. Christmas's oh investors were not happy with planes that didn't fly, didn't but sell, they still gave him and never money seemed prior to, work. to this. By 1912, without endeavoring to address its obvious shortcomings as a company, and with the threat of imminent legal issues, it was obvious that change would soon be necessary to save this bull. Like from actually making startup. an airplane? So Dr. Christmas then started the Durham Christmas Airplane Sales and Exhibition Company. What? Which exhibited aircraft that nobody ever saw fly because they were towed to shows or existed in the mad imagination of Dr. Christmas. It was not uncommon on the east coast of the United States in the early teens for Dr. Christmas to just show up at an air show, claiming he'd invented planes built around principles. None of these is a Dr. Air Dr. Christmas aircraft. So essentially, he sold people real-sized models, full-sized, one-to-one -one scale. You know what, if he'd actually put it that way, I could see people going for it at a much lower rate, and he probably wouldn't have gotten into as much trouble. I'm assuming people literally chasing him with pitchforks will at some point happen, and if it doesn't, I will be disappointed. Which no one but God and he understood. And I'm sure God had nothing to do with this one. Because Dr. Christmas felt constrained and tragically underappreciated by all of these other small-thinking aircraft pretenders who built... Seriously? The con artist felt restrained by pretenders who actually made planes that flew. I mean, God, the sense of victimhood. You know what? Never mind. He's a perfect con artist. He actually believes his own shit. Actual aircraft the general public recognized and actually celebrated. So naturally, as a bold pioneer and absolute genius in all matters aeronautical, self inflated ego, he felt Check. that he had to share his no wisdom actual success with a Check. wider audience. Which, amazingly, what? we have a sample of. What? Dr. Christmas wrote in the New York Times on 5th December 1915 that his warplanes would be the largest, heavier than air aircrafts ever built powered by 1,600 horsepower motors, capable of carrying bombs and ammunition while having a six-man crew. I mean, yeah, we get there in World War II, but at least right now, he hasn't mentioned anything about them taking off because he could probably build all of that without them having to fly, and I'm certain he would even use that loophole. This, god damn. He described his planes as unstoppable and stated that the European allies had already ordered 11 of his superb, quote, Only 11? battle cruisers, end quote. Of course. As you'd expect, no evidence of such planes as described by Dr. Christmas has ever been brought to light. And he also However, bought an ad. this sort of bold visionary of stuff as promised in print had an actual effect. It attracted investors. More specifically, Dr. Christmas had attracted the attention into the direct financial support of Henry and Alfred McCory, who, as brothers, yep. owned a New York brokerage firm. So, amazingly, by 1918, Dr. Christmas started the Cantilever Aero Company and had... I'm sorry. He was already taken to court. Investors knew he was a scam. He was going around and making himself publicly available and claiming... All of the things that happened there, he was doing better than. Where he was pictured not doing anything. How do you invest in someone who is so publicly a scam? I mean, honestly, if he actually makes a working play at some point, I'm going to consider that the greatest miracle of all. And if it actually happens on Christmas, I'm going to laugh my ass off. But I, I don't even... It... I don't... This is literally hurting my brain. That people are like, you know what? He was at the New York. You know what? Never mind. I just saw it. there's literally no creative, not even creative thinking. It's critical thinking. There's literally no critical thinking. People say that's not a thing that happens now. I just assume that people don't have common sense or critical thinking ability, and it just never happened. Uh, you know, people say smartphones are out people's brains. I'm assuming brains just started that way at this point. Relocated in New York. However, as oh, we've discussed, by 1918, the world had changed. What? Dr. Christmas perhaps realized that the war was winding down, 
and he'd need to make something soon or risk Did making he actually nothing make at all. a giant His designs plane? had evolved rapidly and spectacularly so over the past four years. While no one had called him out for fanciful descriptions of planes that weren't real, fanciful no one was very was nice and his very praises generous. either. And that, I feel, directly threatened his sense of greatness. People the world over. You know what? I'm not even going to doubt text on this one. It probably did threaten his sense of greatness. How dare these small-minded men do such things as actually succeed what I have never done yet? Hmm. Pathetic. Uh, you know, I'm joking, but at the same time, I fully believe that is the exact line of thought that crosses mind, and it pains me to even having said that out loud. Ugh. Knew of the Spad 13, of the Sopwith Camel, of the Fokker D7 and DR1. Together? The Great War had planted the seed of daring aeronautics the saving the world, of knights of the sky and dashing heroes fighting each other over Europe. The world was warming up to aviation. Soon enough, people were hungry for newer, better, faster planes. I'm nearly alcoholic Even enough for this. mail would soon be carried through the air oh, through yeah, regular service. It was a wild era, and planes grabbed the imagination like nothing. Funny thing about that, there's still plane drop-offs. Sometimes in remote places, others... I mean, when I lived up in a slightly rural city outpost, I lived in the city, but if you went five miles in any direction, it was rural. And if you went another five out, there were still functional hooks where the mail drop-off could happen. I'm not sure if they were used, but they were still maintained just in case. So, yeah, this is technically still in service. The mail drop-offs by air. Nothing else. It is on this stage that Dr. Christmas had decided to make his great play. He actually made he one finally? the world was ready for his greatest work. Is that his him? magnum opus. He would call it the Christmas Bullet. Oh, what the hell did he actually do? This is the part of the story where Dr. Christmas starts to truly earn the unfortunate title of con man. As he did it before? To his friends as most bullshitters dabbling in business do. He instead... No, 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 go back. They had what? Impress his friends as most bullshitters... Yes, they had ostrich races. I'm going to be honest here. That actually sounds kind of fun. I kind of want to see that more. Why did we stop doing that? Dabbling in business do. He instead visited the Continental Aircraft Corporation of Long Island, New York, and still which was an actual aircraft company, and began to tell oh. them a story. His pitch went like this. Dr. Christmas wasn't just designing a plane. He was designing very the tall. best plane in the world, or probably something and very, very much like it. To sell this point, Dr. Christmas then claimed, with multiple eyewitnesses, that the aircraft he was designing would be the key element in a plot to kidnap Kaiser Wilhelm II of Germany, who was, at that time, somewhat running parts of the German Empire. The parts at that point, currently trying to shell Paris again at least. So, for the record... I don't know which is worse. That it's such a obvious bullshit lie. Or the fact the only reason Tex would bring this up is if they probably believed him? How? Like, this is actually hurting my brain. Like, he must have been massively... You know what? Actually, I was going to say he's massively charismatic, but frankly, he sounds like a freaking sociopath, and they are well known to be incredibly charismatic and charming to be with him. A lot of people believe them because they just really like how they are as a person when you deal with them. Mine is the fact that they will literally do anything to get what they want, and as evidence here, he's literally doing anything to get what he wants. <sighs> I didn't realize this video would be so taxing on my sense of humanity being viable that just this is convincing me otherwise a crazy person born when the civil war was winding down had stumbled into the offices of the continental aircraft corporation which was a real aircraft company manufacturing actual aircraft which flew more often than not and had told them 
he was designing an emperor snatching super plane to end the war and usher in a great How did he new convince peace. Them? Naturally, the management team and corporate directors Kicked at Continental out. Aircraft thought a moment, considered the outcomes, Kicked him out. weighed their options, Kicked him out. and then they agreed to help. Somehow, the mesmerizing charisma of Dr. Christmas had convinced the senior management of the Continental Aircraft Corporation to the point that they agreed to immediately devote significant resources to the project. And his mesmerizing Dr. Christmas effect doesn't stop there. For his good cheer and demeanor won him many friends from all walks of life. However, his favorite friends were mostly the wealthy and the powerful, and nearly exclusively those with assets or resources he could and would exhaustively use. And that part there is probably the reason he succeeded more than anything else. Between the charisma and, see, look at my friends. They're powerful, and I wouldn't be friends with them if they didn't know I was as well. I don't know I'm using that voice for him. It's much too dignified. And I'm the one doing it, and so there should be no dignity there at all. And that's exactly the point I'm trying to make. I got nothing else to say. I just need to literally take a second to wrap my head around this. <sighs> Brass, iron, balls, and a head that's lit by a lantern without a freaking candle in it. Dr. Christmas approached New York Senator James Wolcott Wadsworth and in short time got him to back this war ending an incredibly bold proposal. The senator agreed probably because the plane would be built in New York. Also, crazy inventions were a dime a dozen in this time. So and factor in, nobody apparently does any background checks. He wasn't even hiding the bullshit. It was documented. He documented it by going places in person. They had newspapers. They had probably newspaper clippings. And no one's like, hey, what other things has this guy done? Oh, he scammed a bunch of people and they took him to court? There's literal court records! I don't, I don't need... I don't, I don't, I don't, mm. So I somewhat understand him not paying the fullness of his attention on the matter. That and Dr. Christmas had an ability to dazzle people in ways we still have trouble understanding. Was it As drugs? The radiating effects did he, did of he Dr. drug Christmas them? Did he give them just a bunch of spiked drinks? A century later. But we'll get to that. Well, that's just too optimistic. Dr. Christmas badly needed the senator's signature, as access to certain resources in wartime are strictly limited. Yeah. However, at this juncture, we have to talk about the poor bastard who unfortunately had to watch all of this happen. What? The one sane voice we have in this chorus of madness. The one trustworthy one, at least. Enter Vincent Bernelli. Vincent Justice Bernelli was, at that time, the chief engineer at Continental. He would go on to have a long and storied career building oh. and designing aircraft that worked pretty damn well. Personally, I feel he's one of the unsung heroes of early aviation, but the Christmas design as a collaboration between Continental Aircraft and the Good Doctor was his first true crisis in engineering. And I feel probably the real reason he tried so very hard for the rest of his life. So oh. you're probably asking yourself, just what was Dr. Christmas's grand idea? This so-called plane of planes. No, I should try to do it. The actual plane is being built. Oh no. Proposed as a scout, the first prototype of the Christmas bullet broke most of the common rules of aviation as we understood them at the time. Like being able to was fly without as wings. A aircraft, and Dr. Christmas boldly point, claimed sure, that the bullet not? would effortlessly make 175 miles an hour with a proposed range of 550 miles and a service ceiling in excess of 14,000 feet. Well, we can do that if now. If any of those promises were realized, the bullet would have been truly remarkable. But if all of those, it would have been revolutionary. But however. Then you look at what shape and form those promises take, and yeah, you naturally begin to have doubts. On paper, it looked bad, real bad. So the chief at Continental Aircraft started. I'm going to be completely honest. The 3D model that they're doing right now, one, really good job, Tex. I'm getting that. Two, it's doing more justice to this plane than it really deserves. I'm just looking at this and going. No. 
don't. This is probably a toy at best, and it's not going to... It's a huge, thick body, but it's not even arrowed... I don't... Just... Why is there a vent underneath it that looks like it's just a grate for air intake, but it could be outtake? I don't know, because it's coming through here, and it looks like that's just a giant radiator behind it. But then you can't even see, because you have the pilot literally blocked off, so he has to stand up to see... Oh, that's what my problem is. I don't even know. ...started to raise concerns. Because he knew better. He also knew math. Fairly handy Maybe then. the pilots that's higher Bernoulli than I thought. patiently documented many of the fairly serious issues with the aircraft as yeah. proposed. I'm assuming and no one listened to this guy. raised issue to Continental Management. He was then overruled by Continental Management. Bernelli was deeply concerned. And now we are having the time our tradition of management is fucking idiots. And rightfully so with the design theories Dr. Christmas had been suggesting around the offices at Continental. So he began to keep a diary. For example, Dr. Christmas had suggested that all wood construction with veneer cladding would reduce aerodynamic drag to unrealistic extents. And that was the least concerning problem for Dr. Christmas simultaneously claimed to be the inventor and originator of such a construction system which he then also claimed veneer. to have patents on. This Actually patented death trap wing design. Let's go. Wait. Yeah. Oh my, did he actually? Then also claimed to have patents on. This was again a continual Dr. Christmas trend. Proof that you can patent anything. Full well that none of this was true, but offered to help all the same. He knew it was bullshit! Zoom, he must have been he screaming inside. After all, Dr. Christmas had just casually claimed to invent methods of aircraft construction already fully in use by the powers of Europe, then currently at war, which suggested either Dr. Christmas was very unaware of how airplanes were actually made, yes, or that he was at the dawn of the 20th century the first living embodiment of fake it till you make it philosophy applied to ruinous scale. Why Bernoulli yes. initially went along with this, I feel is perhaps a result of realizing that aviation was frequently a grim business for those who said impossible too early, even if the impossible was in fact impossible. As such, Bernelli would ins- So part of it was also because, all stupidity aside, they had seen so many of their word view, not word views, world views shattered that they were willing to throw aside common sense because their previous common sense was proven incorrect. Like, we were wrong before about people never being able to fly, so obviously we may be wrong now about this guy being completely lunatic. Huh. Uh, even using the 20s voices and helping me at this point, it's just depressing. Insist, and the historical record supports that his input upon the Christmas bullet was limited to the design of the veneer cladding on the fuselage, and that all of his serious, repeatedly expressed concerns over the rest of the aircraft from theory to construction were overridden by Dr. Christmas telling another folksy story or anecdote to describe how the plane would certainly work. In short, Dr. Christmas would continue to get his way by mesmerizing the room until they all agreed with him. Even in a room full of aviation experts, even while knowing nothing of practical aviation, even while saying things that were, even then, commonly understood to be untrue, he got his way. And Dr. thus, Christmas I refer effect. again to what I call the Dr. Christmas effect. For instance, when asked on why his planes lacked wing supports or spars and thus actual structural rigidity in flight, Dr. Christmas insisted that the wings be flexible and flap, like a bird does, of course. And nobody stopped him. So not only is the design bad, so it doesn't have optimal flow, and then it would also just force itself at odd angles. They weren't supported? I thought there was just a metal structure in there, and they, they just, I don't... They said maybe it's by the end of the war. I don't know when the fixed wing parts came in. No, 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 no. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Death trap. That, that is. 
I know just enough about aviation. And honestly, I don't think anyone should ever doubt. This is bad. They all nodded, save Bernelli, who determined to try to stop it. But before Dr. Christmas, they tried flapping though. We have video of people with flapping planes that failed. As in the bullet didn't have one yet. Wartime production had strictly reduced the availability of war material like high output engines. Which the might be a saving grace for the, the pilot. Christmas bullet was a Liberty 6, which looked like this. For early pursuit aircraft, Liberty 6 was damn near ideal. They were so ideal that their availability was practically impossible. Oh. As they were a controlled war material item slated for use in actual aircraft that would actually fly. Actual war. But Dr. Christmas had friends in high places. He actually got so the army was forced to give Dr. Christmas and CAC one Liberty 6 power plant for ground tests only. A ground test means that the plane should not leave the ground. And, the and with how it's designed, that is still not safe, probably. I'm assuming if you tip over and the plane falls on you as its wings tip, it just probably shatter into pieces. I'm assuming something breaks and hits you. Ah! <sighs> and thus we see the Greek tragedy of Cassandra repeated in reality. Where the one prophet says, this will not work. And everyone else is going, but the funny man says it does. That the engine should not leave the ground or be used in a plane that does at any Let's point. Let's not even touch the corruption of the giving this guy an engine. engine. This is a controlled piece of technology. For the application in the Christmas bullet, as the government was a fair bit skeptical of the flappy airplane and its unproven and eccentric designer. It was at this point a test flight was scheduled in complete violation of that limited use requirement because Dr. It's Christmas said so. It's less stable than a paper Vincent airplane. Justice Bernelli was at the end of his rope as he knew the Christmas bullet was a death trap. He knew Dr. Any Christmas fast was wind full will of just snap shit, those wings. And he knew that if he continued, it's somebody it was going to fast. die. Overridden by Dr. Christmas and consolidated management at every turn, Bernelli did the honorable thing. Quit. He resigned from Continental Aircraft in protest and walked away. Good. He refused to sign off on a joke or be associated professionally with a madman, regardless of the promised fame or wealth. And with Bernelli now gone, it was all on Christmas for a miracle. You know, I want to say this is shocking that this level of stupidity and just letting someone with a proven record of being a con artist bullshit his way to the top is completely unrealistic, but... It, it happened! And I can see people listening because con artists are... a thing! If you tell someone a lie they want to believe, they believe it. And he had something that he wanted to believe as much as everyone else. Ah, uh, I, I just, I, I just need to go and just not this. I thought the most fucked up thing I would see this week would have been the stuff that uh, Super Eye Patch Wolf did with Garfield. No, no, this is more fucked up because somehow it's even less believable, but it's real. Tex, I gotta ask, how did you find this? And how did you keep yourself from just swearing at the unbridled stupidity of people who had first documented sources on hand? Because this isn't someone who would just be in a podunk town who wouldn't have had access to doc the, the records, his actual published records from when he went to fairs, or the fact there was a literal court case about him being a con artist. These people would have had access to that. And then the fact that the military was literally forced through blatant corruption. Granted, this is prior to the 20s when Teapot Drum came out, so it's honestly, that's not the most believable thing. To give him a controlled substance, a controlled piece of technology. That is the kind of shit that there were only 20, 52 made, according to the one cutout tech show. And that, that, that just... Everything about this hurts my head and I hate it, but also it's fascinating. 
it's like a heist movie where you hate the main character, but it's so damn compelling. You kind of want to see them fail, but you want to see just how spectacularly it fails. And it's, it's probably going to. <sighs> Basically, what I'm saying is, Tex did a great job. There's a link below. Hit it up. It's for the Black Pants Legion. They're great. And just go let Tex, let everyone in the Black Pants Legion know they did an amazing job. And it's just freaking amazing. And I'll see you guys in the next one. Adios.